So our next speaker this morning is uh, me. Uh, uh, my name is Chris Pittenger. I'm the director of the OCD Research Clinic here. And I'm very much a product of the Ribicroft Research Labs that Dr. Crystal told you about this morning. Um, I'm, I'm active both in, in work in animal models uh, and in clinical research, which is what I'm going to be talking to you about today. And it's unique that those coexist on either side of the hallway in a single facility, together with educational facilities and patient care facilities. It's, it's really a unique place that, that cultivates synergies in the development of new treatments. Um, I have a few disclosures, none of which are particularly relevant uh, to what we're talking about today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today uh, about obsessive compulsive disorder. And uh, obsessive compulsive disorder is probably familiar to many of you. I'll spend a few slides orienting uh, those of you to whom it may not be familiar, because it is a little bit less visible than some of our, of our disorders. I think people, uh, when, when major mental illness comes to mind, for many people, depression, bipolar, substance abuse, schizophrenia are the, are the ones that come up first. And, and OCD is maybe a little bit lower on the list. Um, OCD is characterized by obsessions and compulsions, hence the name. And something that I want to emphasize is that obsessions and compulsions aren't actually that foreign. Obsessions are, are things that all of us have to some extent. And compulsions are things that all of us do to some extent. OCD is a matter of degree. So obsessions are intrusive thoughts, intrusive, inflexible, or stereo stereotyped thoughts. So when, when someone finds themselves always getting stuck thinking the same thing or the same category of thing over and over again, and they don't want to, that's what I, that's what I mean by intrusive. And again, if you think about it, I don't think that's an unusual experience. We all get you know, odd thoughts pop into our minds that cause us a little bit of, of uh, discomfort. We wish they would go away. And usually they do for most of us. Um, I have to start a timer to keep myself honest. So. There. Um, but that, that's what we mean by, by obsessions. And they're associated with anxiety or discomfort. So an example might be an intrusive thought that, you know, here I am giving a talk, and oh wait, Dr. Perlson was here before, and I don't know, I don't know, is Dr. Perlson healthy? Uh, now I might be contaminated or dirty, right? And that might, depending on where you are, if you're in a hospital, that, that might be a perfectly reasonable thought. It's when it grabs you and you can't get rid of it, and it causes a great deal of anxiety or discomfort that we call it an obsession. And obsessions, as is implicit in a few things I've said already, are egodystonic. That's kind of a Freudian term in, in, in origin. But what it means is that the obsession feels different from a normal thought. It feels somehow imposed on you by your own brain. So unlike uh, some, some people with, with schizophrenia or other psychoses that might feel that a thought is in, you know, imposed on them from some external force, that's not the experience in OCD. But it's that imposed on you by your own brain. Um, they're excessive or irrational, and usually people recognize them as such. You know, I know that Dr. Perlson's a reasonably healthy guy, and I know that I have a reasonably, reasonable immune system, and I should be fine. And yet, the thought, if the thought persists, that's excessive or irrational. And they're, by their nature, difficult to control. If they don't have all these characteristics, we wouldn't call them obsessions. We would call them normal, you know, normal patterns of thought, albeit maybe a little bit of an unwanted or anxiety-provoking thought. Compulsions are actions taken to neutralize the distress associated with obsession. So if I feel that I might be contaminated and that's causing me distress, I might wash my hands. I might sort of fake wash my hands and then I might feel a little better. Again, if I feel quickly better, I'm not going to call that OCD. Perfectly normal thought. But, but if I don't feel a little better, if I have to engage in that behavior repeatedly or in a stereotyped or ritualized way and that starts to get in the way of my ability to live my life or to cause me a great deal of distress, that's when we start to call it a disorder. Compulsions tend to be repeated and stereotyped. They tend to be excessive or irrational. And usually people know they're excessive or irrational, but they feel compelled to do it anyway. Um, and the problem is, if I feel that I'm dirty or contaminated and that makes me anxious, and then I wash, so the obsession, here we go. So the obsession, I feel that I'm dirty or contaminated, that causes me anxiety, so I wash, and that makes me feel a little better. That's great, that's the most natural thing in the world. The problem is the cycle, it's that last arrow. It's that engaging in the compulsions makes the whole thing stronger. It means I'm gonna be more likely to pay attention to that obsession the next time it happens. I'm going to be more likely to engage in the compulsion, and over time, this cycle can reinforce to the point that it begins to dominate my mental life. And that's OCD. There are particular forms of symptoms in OCD that explain an awful lot 
of the disorder, two different people with OCD can have very different thoughts and behaviors, but about three quarters of them fall into one of these three categories. Contamination with an urge to wash, which is one common one. A need for symmetry or order. This actually bothers me a bit. Um, so a, a, a need to have things be, be balanced or, or symmetrical and, and to feel a, a sense of incohate discomfort until they are. And the compulsion there would be fixing it, which I have an urge to do. Um, and, the, and, and intrusive, de, intrusive thoughts of, of terrible things happening, which are often rational, like someone might break into my house and steal my stuff and so I have to check my lock, perfectly reasonable thought, perfectly reasonable behavior, until I feel that I have to check it 50 times and I can't sleep because of it, at which point it becomes OCD. These can also be irrational. Um, I had someone come to me and tell me that they had to do things in particular patterns of three and in a ritualized way because if they didn't, a soldier might die in Afghanistan. And this individual was perfectly intelligent, rational, was able to tell me that I know this makes no sense, I know it makes me sound crazy, and I know it's probably wrong, but I feel it so strongly that I have to do that. What if I didn't do it, and then I read in the news that someone had died in Afghanistan, which could happen, I would feel so guilty, I have to do it anyway. So these can be rational or irrational associations. So these three clusters of symptoms explain an awful lot of OCD, though, though not all of it, and many people have symptoms that spread across these clusters. I said earlier that OCD is perhaps less appreciated in the popular culture, and unfortunately sometimes by mental health professionals relative to some of the other major mental illnesses, but it is an enormously burdensome illness. It affects approximately one person in 40 over the course of a lifetime. It's actually more common than bipolar 1 or schizophrenia. Um, it, uh, and, and about one person in 80 over the course of any given year. Uh, it's enormously, it causes an enormous uh, degree of morbidity, of suffering. Uh, in a WHO survey back in the 90s, it was found to be the top, one of the top 10 uh, sources of morbidity behind substance abuse and depression and behind schizophrenia, but, but still enormously burdensome. And the reason I think that people don't, um, do, that it doesn't, it doesn't quite get the, the, the press or the public recognition is because people do tend to know that their symptoms are irrational. They do tend to know that if they share their symptoms with those around them, they will be seen as crazy. They don't want that, and so they hide them. And people with OCD can be enormously effective at hiding their symptomatology, even from those close to them. Um, we, have, uh, we have effective treatments, both pharmacology and psychotherapy. Um, Unfortunately, treatment and diagnosis are often delayed for some of the reasons I've already des described to you. But in addition, even if we apply the best treatments that we have available today, about one person in four tends to, to continue to suffer despite those treatments. So there's a huge need, as there is for all of the mental illnesses you're hearing about this morning and others, there's a huge need for the development of new treatments, more efficacious treatments, and personalized treatments. And that's a major thrust of my research program that I'm going to share you a, a few snippets of uh, with you today. So OCD is interesting. You've seen pictures uh, from both Dr. Sinha and Dr. Perlson. You've seen pictures of activation of regions of the brain in association with symptoms of different neuropsychiatric diseases, addiction, bipolar, psychosis. And the same is true in OCD. In fact, OCD was the first disorder when functional brain imaging was first developed back in the 1980s. It's the first disorder in which some early studies showed that there were specific parts of the brain that are more active in individuals with OCD than in controls and that are more active in individuals with OCD when their symptoms get bad than they are when their symptoms are more in abeyance. This is one of those early studies shown here. This may be the very first one, but there may have been a 1986 one, um, by Lou Baxter and his colleagues at UCLA. And um, what they did, this is, this is a PET scan study. Um, we're looking at, at virtual slices through the brain this way, so imaging the brain in horizontal sections this way, at the top, the middle, and a little bit lower down, and the colors indicate how active different regions of the brain are, how much blood is going to them, how much the neurons are firing, how much information they're processing, how active they are. Warmer colors indicate more activity. And so this is the pattern of activity in a normal brain. The thing that jumps out at you most is here. This is the occipital lobe back here. It's the visual cortex. These people have their eyes open. They're looking at things. The visual part of their brain is very active. Okay. When you compare that to someone with OCD, you also see a very active visual cortex. Looks perfectly normal. But up here in the front of the brain, you see some elevated activity. You see it in some of these deep structures. These are the basal ganglia, which you heard about from Dr. Perlson. And most strikingly, you see it up here. 
This is the orbitofrontal cortex, which you heard about from Dr. Sinhats, the cortex in the front that lies right above the eye sockets, orbitofrontal cortex, front above the eye sockets. And this, is, this was the first time it was shown, but this is the most reproduced study in OCD, uh, the hyperactivity in the orbitofrontal cortex, and it's the focus of what I'm going to be telling you about today. All right. Um, now, another way, a much more, much more up-to-date way that this has been looked at is using an fMRI technique that Dr. Perlson introduced to you. So instead of using PET imaging, which uses radioactive tracers to show you how active different parts of the brain are, this technique uses fMRI, resting state fMRI connectivity, to tell you about how much different parts of the brain are talking to each other. Okay? And what they did in this study, uh, the first study using this technique was done by Harrison in Australia, is they looked at a particular part of the brain that we know is implicated in OCD in the basal ganglia, which is down here. We're now, just to orient you, before we were looking at slices through the brain like this, we're now looking at slices that are much better, show you more anatomy, because it's a more modern study, but they're now going through the brain like this. So this is the front, so the orbitofrontal cortex is right there. This is the back, the, the occipital cortex, the, the eyes. I'm sorry, the, the visual eyes are up here. Visual cortex is back here. It always confuses the med students. But, um, anyway, so what they did is the, in this study is they looked at the basal ganglia and they said, okay, where else in the brain is correlated with, is connected to, is talking to the basal ganglia in healthy people and in people with OCD? And what they saw, yellow here is regions that they saw the basal ganglia talking to, it's actually it's the ventral striatum, the nucleus accumbens, technically, which is part of the basal ganglia, who it's talking to in both OCD and healthy controls. The red is where it's talking a lot more in people with OCD. So what you can see is that there is a spread of the connections from the basal ganglia to the frontal cortex, including the orbitofrontal cortex down here, also the medial frontal cortex here, and these are the structures that I'm going to be coming back to as I talk to you about some new some treatment development. Um, so it appears that this, it appears that this, um, this connection is, is stronger, is more spread, is more dominant in individuals with OCD. So we, we recently did a study, this was with Dr. Alan Antichevich, a talented neuroimager here who was also a collaborator with Dr. Perlson. We looked at the structure of the OCD brain using fMRI and we saw similar things. So we saw some new stuff, we saw some regions on the outs of the cortex. This is a, the image is a little different, but it's showing you the same thing. This is the outside of the brain, the front and the back. We saw some regions of the lateral cortex that seem to be a little bit reduced in connectivity. They're not, they're not quite as integrated into the rest of the brain in OCD. We saw some regions in the basal ganglia that are more integrated in OCD. This is all telling us stuff we already knew. This is Alan Antichevich who worked with me on that work. Um, and in the basal ganglia, we saw something very interesting, which is, so this is now, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm showing you all sorts of different brains in different orientations, which is, Confusing if you're not used to looking at them, but uh, let's look at this one. This is again, this is what you already looked at. This is the, it's called a sagittal cut. It's down through this way. We can see these parts of the basal ganglia ha are, are more talking, talking more to the rest of the brain. And this part, this key section, the nucleus accumbens, the same one that was, I showed you in the last slide was talking more with the frontal cortex, is a little bit less integrated. So it's talking more with the frontal cortex, and we replicated that. It's talking more with the medial frontal cortex here, but it's talking less with everything else in the brain. So on average, it's less integrated. It's this interesting, interesting dichotomy. It's as if it's locked in conversation with the medial prefrontal cortex to the exclusion of its ability to interact with everything else. And I can sort of wave my hands and make up a, a, you know, make up a, a story about how that correlates, that's associated with how people with OCD are locked in patterns of behavior, emotion, and thought. Um, to the exclusion of more normal integration with the rest of their behavioral world or the world around them. So this is the circuit that we um, are focused on in, in one aspect of my research program, trying to, you know, having identified this abnormality, this, with this, this, this circuit that's, that's, that's rigidified, that's locked in, a, in an exclusive conversation and not integrated enough, how can we calm that down? How can we change that? And will that give us a new avenue to treatment? 
And I'm going to tell you about two studies, most, including some published and some unpublished work, where we've tried to do this. I do want to caveat as I, as I, before I go forward, these are treatment studies. We're trying to figure out new ways to intervene, new ways to treat people with OCD. But they're still at the research level. These are, not, these are things that I want to share with you. I hope I'll convey some of my excitement about the potential of these treatments. They're not yet ready to roll out to general treatment. They're still research studies. So I, I, I do want to caveat that at the beginning. Hopefully in the coming years, I won't have to make that caveat. So I want to remind you that in patients with OCD, we have this hyperactivity in the orbitofrontal cortex. And also in the second set of studies I showed you, we have that the orbitofrontal cortex is locked in conversation uh, with other parts of the brain. That's the circuit that we want to modulate. And working with a, a wonderful collaborator, Michelle Hampson, in the Department of, uh, of Radiology here at Yale, um, we've used a technique called neurofeedback to do precisely that. What is neurofeedback? Well, we know that when we treat people with OCD, this hyperactivity in the orbitofrontal cortex is reduced. Okay? That, I haven't shown you that data, but that's been shown. That's true if we treat people with medications. It's true if we treat people with psychotherapy. So maybe, so we know treatment reduces the brain activity. Maybe if we reduce the brain activity, that would be a novel treatment, right? That's, that's the motivating theory. Um, and the way we wanted to do this, so you can imagine doing this in ways that are quite invasive, and these are occasionally done in very severe cases where we collaborate with neurosurgeons, try to modulate the abnormalities in the circuitry. But obviously that's, that's pretty invasive. You're only going to do that in the most extreme cases. Could we modulate this hyperactivity in a way that was a little bit less invasive, a little bit easier to deploy for more, and therefore potential benefit to more people? Here's how neurofeedback works. So biofeedback, which may be familiar to many of you, is the idea that you can learn to control things about your own body that you wouldn't normally be able to control by being shown them and learning and practicing. For example, if I tell you all, please lower your heart rates now, my guess is most of you would not be able to consciously, you probably consciously, don't consciously know what your heart rate is, you can try to figure it out, but you probably don't know, and you probably can't lower it on demand. But if I were to show you your heart rate on a screen, and say, see that number? That's your heart rate. I want you to practice. I want you to experiment and learn how to move that number up and down. And over time, a lot of people can do this and can learn new skills and new ways to control their own bodies um, by, by doing that. Well, neurofeedback's exactly the same thing, except instead of showing people their heart rate, I'm going to put them in a brain scanner and I'm going to show them the activity of their orbitofrontal cortex. So if I said to all of you, hey, everybody, turn down your orbitofrontal cortex by 20%. My, my guess is most of you probably would look at me funny and you, you, know, you wouldn't, wouldn't, really, wouldn't be able to do that. What we set out to do and what, what, with, uh, what Dr. Hampson set out to do um, in studies that began before I started working with her is to see if people can use biofeedback to do exactly that, to learn to turn down their orbitofrontal cortex. So this is the orbitofrontal cortex. Its wiring is messed up in OCD. And so we took a bunch of people, and then we first, and the, most of the data I'm going to show you aren't in people with OCD. They're in people with some OCD symptoms, but they're not that bad. They have subclinical OCD. This is where we started. We're now, we're now trying to roll this out for people with, with clinical OCD. We, put, we, we selected specifically people who have contamination phobia, who really you know, have a, a desire to wash, really don't like yucky stuff. And we showed them pictures of yucky stuff. We warned them. Yeah. Um, and we looked at what parts of the brain were activated when we showed them a picture of mud or toilets or other uh, unpleasant contamination images versus control images. And this is what we saw. We saw activation in the orbitofrontal cortex and in some of the medial frontal cortex. Others had shown this before. This was not a surprise. But it's, it's lighting up the, the regions that we're interested in, in, in teaching them to better control. And importantly, it's doing it on an individual basis. So in each individual person, we figure out exactly where in their frontal cortex that person tends to light up when they're confronted with a, an unpleasant contamination image. And then we show them this. We show them a picture, either a neutral picture or a contamination picture. This is intended to be a neutral picture, though I don't know. Libraries are kind of dusty. This might be disturbing to some, but it's intended to be a neutral picture. Um, and then we give them an instruction. We say, here is the activity of your orbitofrontal cortex. I want you to either just relax, don't worry about it, that's white, or increase it, that's red, or decrease it. That's that kind of greeny-blue color. Um, and this is someone who's already been doing this for a couple hours. They've been fairly successful. That's why I'm showing them to you. Uh, but you can see that, in general, their activity is going up in the red and down in the blue. They've successfully learned to control their orbitofrontal cortex to an extent. Okay, so people can learn to do this. Just 
as a scientific question, that's pretty cool, that, that people can actually use this kind of feedback to learn to control their brain. Does it make a difference? Well, yes, it does. We took 10 people with some contamination uh, phobias, and, and we uh, gave half of them this, this biofeedback, and we gave half of them a control condition, where they were also in a magnet. They actually didn't know which condition they were in, but they weren't getting real biofeedback. And then we asked them before and after, how anxious do these contamination images make you? And lo and behold, the people who got the real biofeedback had improvement in their anxiety. And the people who had the control biofeedback, even though they didn't know which condition they were in, did not have that change. So this actually makes anxiety better. Again, this is an OCD yet. This is people with some, some subclinical OCD symptoms. Furthermore, it changes the connections of the brain. And I'm not going to go through this in, in great detail. Um, these are horizontal sections of the brain. And this is the, the blue is showing places where the connections of the brain are reduced. And the warm colors are showing where they're increased. And in very broad strokes, the connections are reduced in some of these um, older, evolutionarily older brain structures that are involved in emotion and anxiety, and they're increased in some of these cognitive control structures that, that help us control our, our urges. Makes a lot of sense in terms of what we think is happening as people get better at controlling their emotional impulses and, and symptoms. Furthermore, the connections here in the front of the brain correlated with how much people got better. All right? Again, this, this fits with our hypothesis. We're making changes in that part of the brain. They're percolating through the whole network, and they're helping people feel less anxious. All right, how about OCD? As a clinician, the goal of, I mean, I think this is, as a scientist, I think this is amazing. But as a clinician, my goal is to turn this into, ultimately, into a treatment. Um, so we started out by treating five people with OCD using exactly the same procedure. The y-axis here is their... Uh, their symptoms, Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale, a scale of, of OCD symptoms developed here before my time. Um, and we gave them one or two sessions of biofeedback, and lo and behold, they all got better. Some of them quite, yeah, this is pretty good improvement in green and in blue. These, these people got substantially better. Furthermore, they loved it. <laughs> they said, this is really helpful. It, I feel like I have more control. Um, so that got us very excited, and we've... Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, and also this correlation where the connections in the front of the brain, the strength of those connections pre predicted who got better, also happened in OCD. Only three people. So we were able to use this data to get, um, to get a new grant, and we're now testing this in people with OCD. And we don't have the data ready for prime time yet. I can tell you that the preliminary results look promising, though we won't have, we won't have a, a definitive result for another year or two yet. But it's, it's exciting times, and it's, a, it's an exciting time to be able to take brain imaging, which is normally, a, a, I mean, at best, a diagnostic technique. It shows us what's going on in the brain, and actually use it as a therapy, as an intervention, as a way to make people better, which is our goal. Uh, we're also looking at ways, lying for several hours in an fMRI magnet, which, you know, if, if you've been in one, it's a you know, metal tube that's pretty noisy and pretty uncomfortable. We're looking at ways to try to bring this out to be a more accessible treatment with the long-term goal of, of bringing it out into the clinic. Though, again, I need to say that this is development in progress. We're not, we're not there yet. I want to take just a couple minutes um, to share with you one other thing that we're doing. Um, to try to, to use brain imaging and some of our growing knowledge of neuroscience to enhance treatment outcomes in OCD. So I told you that we have effective treatments for OCD, both medications and psychotherapy. Um, the medications are the SSRI antidepressants. The psychotherapy is a specific CBT technique called ERP, which I can describe in, the, in discussion afterwards if you'd like. But, but ERP is very effective. It's at least as effective as medications when it's done, when it's done uh, intensively and properly in patients without too many complicating factors. It's very effective. And it's based on a learning phenomenon known as extinction. Extinction is when you're scared of something, like I'm scared of this dirty podium, and then over time you expose yourself to that, to that thing and nothing bad happens. You know, here I'm, I've, been, I've been talking for 20 minutes and I'm, I'm still healthy, so nothing bad has happened. My anxiety has gone down now that I'm extinguishing that anxiety, that association. That's the core learning phenomenon that we capture in CBT for OCD. And studies in animals, and more recently in humans using neuroimaging, have given us a pretty good idea of what structures in the brain are involved in extinction. And they're shown here. And lo and behold, 
There's a couple that I'm not going to talk about here, but lo and behold, this medial frontal cortex region that's already implicated in OCD is also inv implicated in extinction learning. And furthermore, people with OCD aren't so good at it. They're bad at extinction learning. They're bad at recruiting this part of the brain. That's what's shown here in a trial from Mohammed Malad um, in Boston. So we had the following hypothesis. Oh, I want to, I'm sorry, just to remind you, this is very similar to the region where I've already shown you that connectivity is disrupted in people with OCD. So we hypothesized, given what I've shown you, it's not a very novel hypothesis, um, that, that the problems in this part of the brain are getting in the way of extinction learning. And that might contribute to symptoms, but it is certainly going to get in the way of effective therapy. So we hypothesized that if we could somehow target this region and make people better, increase its activity or increase its plasticity, increase its ability to process events in the real world, to learn, then that might enhance behavioral treatments for OCD. And that's what we set out to do. And the way we did that was with a, a, a technique called transcranial direct current stimulation. This is actually conceptually very similar, uh, simple technique. The idea is that the brain is made up of neurons, neurons signal using electricity. So we pass a little bit of electricity through the brain. I mean, really, you just take a nine volt battery, attach a wire to one end, attach a wire to the other, go like this. That's basically transcranial direct current stimulation. Now, it's not quite that simple. We have this funky hat that we had to spend a lot of money on to, to, to make this work. But that's basically the idea. You're patching low voltage, very low, like battery level amounts of voltage through the brain in order to subtly modulate its, its, uh, its activity. And so we did computer simulations, or rather the people who make the expensive hat did computer simulations for us to see if, you know, where do we put these electrodes in order to target the current where we want it to. They did the simulation and they said, okay, you put our put your electrodes here and that'll give you targeting the medial prefrontal cortex, the region we're interested in. We then put people in a brain scanner, so we scanned them, then did the stimulation, then scanned them again to see did we succeed. And lo and behold, brain activity has changed. This is a small experiment. We're increasing the end. Hopefully the picture will get prettier, but you can see that there are some changes right here in the medial prefrontal area we're interested in. We've, we've manipulated it. I don't, can't tell you based on this exactly what we've done to it, but it's a little more active. It's a little more connected. What will that do to learning? So this is what we did, and this is the last data I'm going to show you. We brought in a bunch of patients, and we did extinction therapy with them. Not a full 12-week course of therapy, just two days. But we, we showed them, for example, uh, you know, we, we, I, if I was a patient in the study, we'd make me touch the dirty thing, right? And then I would ask the patient, how anxious do you feel on a scale of 1 to 100? I'm 60%. I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I can deal with it. I'm uncomfortable, but I can deal with it. All right, just sit there. How, well, okay, now 50, 45, it's getting better. Okay, I'm down to 30, so that's extinction, right? And then we did it again, and then because we're not very nice, we did it again, um, and, and, ext and, and extinction continues. So that's what we did. Um, half of the people got this brain stimulation, and half of the people didn't. And again, as in every good treatment study, we were blinded, and nobody knew who was getting what treatment. <laughs> but we watched how, how their extinction looked. And I wouldn't be telling you this story this morning if it hadn't shown us something pretty exciting. This is unpublished work by a postdoc with my group, Tom Adams. Uh, hopefully, they'll be, they'll be publishing soon. But <clears throat> the, the, folks, the, the blue line, it's a little hard to see, but you can see it's, it's elevated there. Those are, that's normal extinction without brain stimulation. And the red is extinction with brain stimulation. And we did complicated statistics, and they told us what's you know, obvious just from glancing at the thing, which is that the brain stimulation made people get better faster. This isn't their symptoms. This is how much anxiety they're caused by this one thing. So again, it's early, early days, but quite exciting. When we brought them the next day, no more stimulation. They were stimulated once at the beginning, but when we brought them back the next day, they continued to show these improvements. So it wasn't just their behavior on that first day. It was actually a persistent learning phenomenon, which is exactly what we think is at the basis of psychotherapy for OCD. So we're optimistic that this can be extended to true clinical therapy, though that is work yet to be done. All right, so that's all I have to show you. Just to, to, to recap, I've shown you how brain imaging has given us a pretty good idea of some of the circuits that are involved in OCD. They've, they've focused our attention on these circuits in the medial prefrontal cortex and the orbitofrontal cortex. And I've shown you two examples about how we can use modern brain imaging and neurobiological insights to try to manipulate that circuitry to try to augment treatment responses in OCD. And our, our hope is that this will um, give us new avenues to treatment in the future for that 25% of people who don't respond to the therapies we currently have to offer. 
Hopefully, I'll be back here in five years and be able to say this is a new treatment. Currently, it's just early steps, but it's ones we're excited about, and I've been very happy to share them with you this morning. Work uh, supported by a lot of collaborators. Uh, the key ones are shown here. Michelle Hampson in the neurofeedback, Ellen Antichevich with the brain imaging, Tom Adams with the brain stimulation and the extinction learning. This work's only possible through the contributions of our funders, both, uh, both governmental, private foundation, and philanthropy. And I thank you all for your attention this morning. <laughs>